All right, guys, welcome to the Jiu-Jitsu Motivation Podcast. I'm with Brian DeLuca again, and today we have an awesome guest all the way from Paris, France. We have Shadi. He's got an amazing YouTube channel that I follow uh, personally. A lot of uh, the students here at Hampton Jiu-Jitsu follow as well, and he's got an amazing channel talking about everything from judo history, uh, martial arts history in general. Um, you really get to see how everything intertwines with all of the grappling arts. So, Shadi, welcome, buddy. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. So, yeah, I think uh, first, yeah, we'll get some a little bit of uh, a background on you and, and the channel. Really, I'd, I'd like to start off with uh, your channel when you started. What was the motivation for that and uh, how did it grow and the process of its growth to where it's at now? Um, when I first started, well, it's uh, it was a combination of being unemployed and uh, a combination of there's when you look things up on YouTube, you, you find very little. Like when I would look up on uh, on YouTube stuff about judo, particularly old events, if I happen to read on something, I go look it up mm. because YouTube, we already know it's a saturated platform. Definitely. Yeah. But all I can find is basically two documentaries. One was Human Weapon. The other one was uh, Samurai Spirit. And yeah. that was it. All the others were just Epon highlights or some old footage of the old masters mm -hmm. that are doing randori, but that's basically it. And there was this huge void to fill. And at the same time, there were just a lot of uh, misconceptions. I don't know who started them, but uh, you know the whole thing with uh, you know where the ground grappling started. Uh, judo is just throws and submission to finish the, the throw. Um, you know, the, the whole thing with uh, where things really came from. Mm. Um, and basically there wasn't anything that, uh, there was basically no one talking about it. You would see old footage, you can scan them, you can see everything, you can watch, but there's no commentary. It's not cut up in a sense to show you mm -hmm. particular something. There was basically nothing. It was only just highlight channels mm -hmm. and uh, old footage of the old masters that I use tons. And there's a lot of it to unpack even till this day, two years later. And uh, it wasn't easy. Like I had zero narration skills. Even till this day, I'm still trying to work on my narration skills, uh, my English. Uh, also, I have zero credibility. Who is Shady? It's not like, you know, Robert Drysdale with his uh, competitive history. And at the same time, uh, I'm not like the, the Valente brothers, which are basically the last black belts of Elio Gracie. So... Mm -hmm. Really, it's, it was someone that's been doing judo for nine months mm -hmm. and trying to make its way into uh, through research and really showing the stuff that he, I'm finding with other people. Obviously, I learned a along the way a lot. I changed my views on a few things. Uh, but uh, this whole thing was a very uh, a pr prosperous and productive journey. And uh, um, I know Robert Drysdale did a lot, but I'd like to think that I somewhat helped in changing the landscape of the conversation regarding history, particularly the origin of ground grappling. Yeah, I mean, what uh, on, on that topic, you know, that was our first episode with Robert Drysdale and Pedro Valente talking about specifically Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu history. Now, on our side in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, it's, it's very, very spotty at best, the stories that we hear mm -hmm. as far as the, the origins. Now, you've seen a lot, I've seen you around out there, you know, um, on different different podcasts and different history topics on that. What, what's your what's your opinion based on what you found now and what you saw in our uh, first episode as far as the history? Um, I think it's very important to really uh, talk, not just find things, because sometimes you might find a lot of things and they might look very clear to you, but someone else can come with, for example, an old newspaper article like uh, Pedro would do. He has them all collected. The man is basically an open library. Um, and then it might you know, make you reconsider. So it's very important to... Um, to really talk with as much as open-minded people as possible, like Drysdale, like Valente, um, because they can help you really clear out the image and see it with like a, a far bigger, uh, like a projector, not just a small flashlight. Mm -hmm. So what, what I took from the old, like your podcast with him, for example, I, uh, I stumbled upon an old fighting of this uh, historian, 
uh, by the name of Shabo. He's Hungarian, so he's uh, from the like uh, or all everything Oriental, Far East, etc. He found these old samurai manuscripts that date back to the 1880s, I believe, and it was from the school of Takino Uchiryu, and a lot of it really coincided with what uh, uh, Carlos Gracie used to say and what uh, Pedro said on your podcast when he said that. You know, those, uh, those Japanese are teaching us a lot of things, but I don't feel they're giving us everything. Mm-hmm. So this particular mentality, it, it really shows from even the old age because um, those manuscripts that have been translated uh, by Shabo, he says uh, it, it's from the school of Takino Uchiryu, the same man that invented the triangle and the Nibar came from that school before even coming to the Kodokan. So a lot of that behavior was actually very present with what he did in the Kodokan in the 1920s. Um, mm. Take, for example, um, it says in those manuscripts, you know, don't, uh, you know, we don't share a lot of techniques. Even in those manuscripts, there's barely any drawings of those techniques because mm. if anyone stumbles upon them, that's basically it for them. And also they say, do not compete. Um, so it's basically more of a self-defense school. They just keep yeah. everything together because at that time in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, a lot of jujitsu school would just get together and they compete with each other. So, you know, giving out your technique or people seeing you do a technique, uh, it's basically giving yourself out. Um, yeah. But it says don't compete. And also it says do not talk badly of other schools. I found that to be very uh, respectable in a sense. So, uh Fast forward to the 1920s, um, you have Kanemitsu, which Pedro mentioned him, I believe. Um, Kanemitsu Yaichibe, he was he had his team of Kosen Judokas. So the Kosen Judo format of competition is actually 15 against 15. You have uh, captain and vice captain and the others, uh, or two vice captains, I believe. Uh, the vice captain and the captains have a longer duration fight, and the others is around, I believe, four or five minutes and the other is eight. Hmm. Again, forgive me if I forget a little bit of details and you have five that are on the bench, something like that. So it's basically 15 against 15. And um, it was Oda. The, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've seen the old footage of Oda uh, doing hmm. Toriando passes, cartwheel uh, passes, pulling guard. Yeah. Um, the stuff hmm. that even till this day are still being done on the highest level. And it was Oda who was reigning champion for the last like six or seven years in the Kosen Judo High School uh, Team Championships. And uh, Kanemitsu was really close every single year. He wanted to dethrone him. And finally, in 1921, him and his student, Masaru Hayakawa, they came up with the triangle choke. The same year, they came up also with the knee bar uh, because the Ashigarami, the submission, was actually banned in 1916. So, but what's interesting is that a few years later, in 1929, it, uh, it, uh, the Triangle Choke first appeared as a published book, as a published work, I'm sorry, in Tsunetane Oda's book, and not Kanemitsu, so his, basically his arch nemesis. And a lot for, for a long time, people thought that it was actually Oda that came up with it. Mm-hmm. So it was basically him not talking about it, not saying anything about it, the Triangle Choke, um, so much so that he did not even document it, and it appeared actually with his uh, nemesis, with his rival team, his coach. So it really shows that he's still keeping up those uh, old mentality of his old jujitsu school, the Takino Uchiryu. Mm. And uh, so I, this really c- uh, confirms what uh, Pedro said about Carlos saying that those Japanese don't really show you everything. Mm-hmm. So that I, this part when he said it, I was like, it really made me shake my head, and that's really true. So that's why we need many people to have a conversation about this because you know you can never know 100 percent for sure but you can always get closer and closer when you have evidence compared with other evidence yeah that's what i believe and it's also stacking up those evidence right to make to make chronological order to you know where they are because we all see these you know chunks of old footage or there's an article here and an article there but what's the real sequence of them you know to you know to your point like who actually did this first Mm. yeah that's the thing is like you, just, ah, you mean like the, the the whole rolling on the ground and really go pushing the ground grappling? Yeah, oh, well, any of it. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's um, well, that's the thing. like you said, it's 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 such a like hard thing to determine. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But uh, here's the thing: there's a lot of uh, high school newspaper articles, very similar to like what Brazil did, but with the old uh, like upper 
schools of or the Kosen schools of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the um, progression and the evolution of how things went from the stand up to the ground or how you got this divergence between, you know, the I would like to call it the Tokyo camp and the Kyoto camp. The mm -hmm. Tokyo was more um, doing like what Kano envisioned of judo being a lot of stand up kata and finishing a fight if it needed on the ground. But like, for example, back then, the pin was only two seconds. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that were uh, allowed, like wrist locks up until the early 1900s. You had neck cranks, you had leg locks. Um, back then, the, the leg, as Drysdale said, the, the leg lock argument of being very dangerous and it can cripple you was, would hold a lot of merit, not so much today, but still, you know, recovering from ACL, it still mm -hmm. held till this day, but you can still recover nonetheless. But the point is, um, you had, you know, Tokyo, who was more of, you know, Kano's vision being standing upright, uh, more involved in the stand up because it's a, um, I'd say it's an, somewhat of an expression of self defense, not so much, you know, ground grappling. But I think it all started like the thing, like the event that really, um, I would say, launched the whole uh, research and really evolving the ground is actually what happened with Matai Montanabe. I saw you uh, share the clip when I was talking with Drysdale, I was talking about uh, when he leg locked people and broke their legs mm -hmm. and people were outraged, I believe in 1899. Um, and that's why um, I would say um, Kaichiro Samura was the uke and also uh, Hajime Isogai, he wanted to basically end the reign of terror of Matai Montanabe. So they had a trilogy. It was from 1899 till the 1900s. Um, Hajime Isogai was a Kodokan judoka. Uh, Kaichiro Samura wanted to help him. So they're basically the, the, um, like the first people to really start to work on the ground in order to get this guy away, like uh, to end his terror against Kodokan judokas because Kodokan judo was very new uh, with its philosophy. It's a progressive philosophy because back then Japan had was going through a transition. Uh, all jujitsu or, you know, judo was starting to take another shape more into education, more into the morality and mm. into the intellect, all that stuff. It wasn't so much more about the old fighting because they saw it as a outdated practice. So Kodakan was very young at that time and they wanted to really establish themselves. But Taiwan Tanabe was really just hammering on their legs or, you know, cross choking them was really far superior than the Kodokan judokas uh, on the ground. So they wanted to figure out uh, a deal for it. So um, at the same time, there was something happening that the Kodokan wanted to branch out from Tokyo and also go to Kyoto in order to really spread out the teachings of Kano. So this is when um, Kaichiro Samura, I'm sorry, uh, Hajime Isogai was transferred to become one of the main teachers and really work there. And Kaichiro Samura was more on the um, administrative part. So this is where I believe he had far more freedom to start working on uh, more groundwork because he was away from Kano. He could have done far more, you know, things as he pleased. And throughout the, uh, like the half of the 1900s, early 1910s, in my opinion, it's where more things started to take place on the ground. Uh, the Kosen Judo at first was, yes, it was high school students. They were, uh, team against team. It started, I believe, in the, 18, in the late 1890s, but mm -hmm. it was very much like judo now, but started to go more on the ground because of the, um, the endurance. They are young. They can endure far more. You know, the cardio is hectic on the ground. Their back cannot you know, have bulging discs when they're 18, or so mm -hmm. you can say it's not like when you're older. So, and also, it's, uh, it allowed them, because they are young and because they are uh, you know, training to become um, you know, the future, you know, businessmen and uh, pioneers of the future, they wanted them to become more strategic. Mm -hmm. So uh, forging more stuff on the ground will help. Uh, like, I'm sure you know this, but, you know, the ground is very strategic. Every little detail counts. When you're trying to do a sweep, it can take like 10 to 12 steps to mm -hmm. get to the sweep and finally to the submission, isolating the limb, so on and so forth. Compared to the stand-up, yes, there are gripping strategies. There's a lot of movements. But uh, compared to the steps, what you do on the ground is a little bit less, a, a lot less actually. The the, um, the gripping tactics on the ground on the stand up is um, 
yes, they are complex, obviously, but um, they're far shorter mm. than what's happening on the ground. You can really forge your way into a submission. So that's how it really started. That was like 1904, 1905, and then onwards. Um, they figured out that um, going to the ground is more strategic. You can have a better strategy against the other team. Uh, guard pulling back then was not prohibited. Uh, and then I would say came Sunetane Oda and really took things to a whole nother limit when it comes to ground grappling in the 1910s. You, you would see him starting doing stuff like the Lahiva sweep, the Toreando passes, the cartwheel passes, uh, different ways of pulling guard, uh, strategically pulling guard. Um, so much so that he gained a lot of popularity in 1918. Uh, he was very much known that uh, his students pull guard and they were very aggressive on the uh, in Newaza, so much so that they started to call it uh, Sunetane Ryu. So uh, it's like a, a completely different school from Kano Ryu or Kano Jiu Jitsu. Hmm. So in 1918, it's what really, like, I believe the, the split, in my opinion, that happened. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you watch my video on it. Um, it's, it's a story where, you know, all the students, they wanted to be Tokyo students. Yep. And they wanted, to, you saw that? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, so they basically beat them with superior groundwork. They even let go of all the stand-up. They would just pull guards strategically and beat them with superior newaza because Tokyo were, were really, you know, taking the time more for the stand-up. So when mm -hmm. they got to the ground, obviously they had the, uh, the upper hand in it. And also guard pulling was not um, prohibited. So... They basically did whatever they wanted. And in my opinion, that's how it really, you know, the split happened. And then you had Kanemitsu that wanted to dethrone him and eventually did. Uh, and then the whole leg lock thing caused a lot of problem, problems with the knee bar in 1921. Uh, and also with Ashigarami, with uh, Matai Montanabe, that in 1925, everything from guard pulling, leg locks, neck cranks were banned. Mm -hmm. So basically Kano wanted to... Uh, establish more his idea of judo but nonetheless Kosen and the leg locks continued but you know on the side for themselves and leg locks eventually traveled to Brazil with uh, um, the Kiriano with the heel hook you know all that stuff so even yeah, you can see that was, uh, I mean, that was a Brazilian catch wrestler right that brought uh, that Kiriano that was a Brazilian catch wrestler that uh, or Brazilian judo guy that brought the heel hook down and leg locks down to Ta Brazil Kiriano. Yeah. Takiriano. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, he, he was a judoka, yeah. Yeah, okay. Wow, that's amazing. I think that's that opened up just a huge amount of topics for us. One for me is, like, mm -hmm. you always hear Kosen Judo being, like, the, the ground specialist, right? My question is, Maeda, the guy who everybody, yeah. everybody you know, says is responsible for bringing Judo and, and, you know, the whole grappling scene to Brazil, he wasn't – he had left Japan, right? He didn't even really know what Kosen was. Like, he was a judoka – um, from the Kodokan. So Maeda, sometimes people can yeah. think that Maeda is a Kozen guy. He's not. He didn't even know um, really a lot of the stuff that were, were focused. A lot of Maeda's stuff were just his own discoveries and his fights. Um, I think a lot of people have that confused. Uh, here's, like, um, that's the thing about Maeda. Yes, he went on. He traveled. He did a lot of things. He accomplished many things. Um, but when it comes to the... Um, genesis of BJJ, so to speak, his story takes more of a, I would call it a more of a romantic um, turn. It's uh, it's not so much, you know, I'm like you, you read the book, you talked with Robert Drysdale, you saw that it's more of a uh, story to give credibility to Gracie rather than it's a true story. Mm. But, you know, it's very romantic. It's, it's, it's very appealing. Um, you know, he went there, he met young Carlos, he was his prized pupil, he taught him, and then this whole revolution started. It's it's it sounds very good, it's it's easy on the ears and it's romantic, but you know, now we know that the history is far more complex. Many Japanese came and went back and contributed to the uh you know, the Brazilian scene of what was happening. And also Elio and Carlos, they had their own idea different from you know, Kodokan, because now in Brazil you have the CBJ mm -hmm. um, and you have, you know, great CBJ, BJJ, all that stuff. So uh, the the thing with Maeda, yes, he was a Kodokan, judoka, uh, Kodokan Judoka normally like everyone else. 
but he himself, I believe, like it's according to Shockey that uh, he wasn't that good on the ground. He wasn't very successful, for example, in his catch wrestling competitions. Mm -hmm. uh, he learned from them a lot because he, he said that you know he needed to work on his ground. But um, in terms of his contribution to the ground, not so much. No, mm -hmm. in yeah, terms so he, of like he, judo, he, all he, judo. He, no, it wasn't. He, it was you know when you had. Kind of, the Ono brothers going in, they were actually students of Kanemitsu, the inventor of the triangle choke and the knee bar. You can see them uh, on the news article preparing for the Gracie fight. They were doing a triangle choke. Uh, Pedro pointed that out. Um, there's also Omori. You had Takeriano. All of them, they are from the Kyoto scene. That's why they were far more skilled on the ground. So that's why I believe um, it's happened. Like You have the Kyoto um, judokas that were more on the ground. Or they trained with someone on Ki with Kyoto, like uh, San Potoku or uh, you know Omori or uh, these people, and then like the, the whole idea of going to the ground went to Brazil. It's not like if it was only Tokyo uh, judokas, I, it would be just I would I would I believe personally it would be just judo, like the the stand up that we do today. Yeah. So you you could you could say pretty confidently that Maeda wasn't a cousin judo guy; he was a judoka from the Kano side that migrated to Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And Drysdale, I think we could say the same thing, yeah. Yeah, you see a lot of history, mm -hmm. like, you know, they trace the roots back to Kozen Judo, really, but then that skips the Maeda narrative, which we've heard, you know, him going to Brazil, he befriends Carlos, which now we know is even questionable, um, it's more about the lineage, you know. Uh, so that's why it's, it's a lot of confusion there. No, I, I do believe that, um, there was an interactions with Carlos and Maeda, for example, the um, with the whole demonstrations that they would do. Yeah, um, you would see in the art the newspaper articles. Um, you would see Carlos Gracie as part of the team, uh, and also they were under Maeda. Like you have Jacinto Ferro and um, mm -hmm. Donato Pires that would train him, but you have Jacinto Ferro that trained directly under Maeda, and also Maeda was present in the show. So for example, if I have a student that's teaching, let's say, or you have a student that's teaching and um, you wanted that student to have a demonstration of BJJ, a presentation on BJJ uh, with um, like say in front of an audience or you're, you're promoting your school, like I'm sure you would wanna go and see what your student is doing with his presentation. And then you would meet the others doing the presentation with him. Mm -hmm. like, there's no way like, okay, do your presentation. I'm not going to get involved. There's just no way. Mm. So uh, did he meet him? I would say yes. And gave him a few uh, insights, instructions while, while they were preparing for those, uh, you know, demonstrations that they did for judo, uh, you know, mm. ex that's, that's exposition. When you said Maeda uh, was known, known not to even be that great on the ground and that he learned a lot from catch wrestling. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, his uh, trip to Britain uh, would uh, like help him a lot. And um, I think it's a very important chapter that we keep uh, glancing over. We often talk about his trust, uh, his trips to like the Americas, everything like uh, South, not just Brazil. But his chapter in Europe is quite interesting. I don't know much about it, but like the, the book Shockey talks about it, uh, his bouts with cash wrestlers. Um, he wasn't that successful, but nonetheless, he learned a lot and sharpened his groundwork. Because he himself said, you know, um, I'm not that much on the ground. So uh, he he was more of a Tokyo judoka rather than like um, like Takeriano and all these people that came later on mm. after him. Because keep in mind, he left um, in the early 1900s. So groundwork wasn't really start like wasn't really getting uh, it's it hasn't been developed like so half of the 1900s up until the, the, the late 1910s is when, you know, groundwork really was being crafted and Maeda left way before that. Wow. Now, do, you, do you find like most students, right? Most martial arts students, they don't even understand the history behind the martial art that they're actually <laughs> practicing day in and day out. Yeah, I know that. Like uh, once uh, we were, like I was in BJJ class and, uh, we were doing uh, Kimura, and I, I said to the guy, like, uh, man, Kimura, when, when he did that to Elio, I was just striking a conversation. I didn't even have a channel back then. He says, uh, who? And I said, you know, <laughs> Kimura. Like, it's called Kimura, like, after the man. Like, hmm, I don't know. It was <laughs> like a, a purple belt. 
See, oh, see, that's crazy because you know, yeah. I mean, that's someone who's been practicing for a good, yeah. you know, solid five years minimum, even yeah. if they're a new purple, At right? Least, and yeah. and they don't know what you know. That's, that's what's amazing to me. Maeda left Japan, you know what I mean, and then now he's left Japan, and yet there's this whole other scene with the Kozen and judo in the 1900s developing this amazing technique on the ground. Yet Maeda left before that. That's even before the triangle was even come up with. We know. Um, and then, you know, that's, everything's being developed via Maeda and then he learns from the catch wrestlers. Now, my thing is, and I really wanted to ask this at the, uh, the first podcast we had with Drysdale and Valente, the whole, it's not even really who, right? Like who's responsible for doing this move and that move. It's what's developed over time. And to me, what came from Maeda and then the Gracies, which now it seems that it's been more the Gracies that developed it. The whole street, uh, self-defense idea of clinch on the feet take your partner down, get to a good uh, position to secure a uh, submission. That whole process, from what I understood, was Maeda teaching the Gracies that. But now the more I'm learning in history, it's, it more seems that the Gracies, through trial and error, developed that whole idea, which changed the whole martial arts world. It, you know, clinch, and we've seen it with Hoyt's Gracie, clinch on the feet, stop the strikes, bring the fight to the ground, get to a secure position, strike mm -hmm. if you need, and then finish with a submission. So it seems to me it's that's more even trial and error over time with the Gracies. Uh, don't get me wrong. When I say his groundwork wasn't you know, special, I didn't mean that he didn't know anything. Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> if you, you know that if yeah. you go, if if you go and see old um, ten, it's judo actually like Jigoro Kano studied. It, two forms of jujitsu. You had the first one being Tenjin Shinyoryu Jujutsu, mm. second being Kitoryu Jujutsu. The scrolls of Tenjin Shinyoryu shows a lot of the staples of today. The they show side control, they show closed mm. guard, they show rear naked choke, they show Jujigitami. So I believe the the transition, like even to the like we do today in Olympic judo, was from way back then. Mm. So, but I'm talking about he wasn't very good, like as in, you know, surviving minutes and minutes on end. That's what I'm talking about. But yeah. in terms of doing a successful throw, continuing it with either a submission or a really solid pin, mm -hmm. he had that combo. That's uh, that's old samurai stuff, basically. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. um, but really, Gracie is, in my opinion, with the whole, like the, the people that came from the, I would say, Kyoto schools, Mm -hmm. uh, and really rolled with them and crafted them and uh, helped them give, like, for example, like, Elio Gracie was really outstanding. Like, if you see his bouts with the Ono brothers, mm -hmm. he threw him over 30 times. And then when they would go to the ground and really, and then would stand up and he would throw him again, stand up, throw him again. Uh, and he couldn't even tap him once. So um, mm -hmm. I'd say it's due to Gracie talent, but also... The, the whole thing with being minutes and minutes on end on the ground also came from the Kyoto lineage, like the Kyoto students that went to Brazil and also coupled with Gracie talent. Yeah. No, you know, that, fighting IQ. I would say Elio had a great fighting IQ. Yeah. that I mean, I even that mentioned that Helio Gracie match where he got thrown, I don't know how many times, and then was able to just, you know, pass him out unconscious by, you know, utilizing his guard and all of that. Now, a guy like Helio who... Got his, Are you, no, you're talking about Kato, like the Kato yeah, match. Kato match, yeah. No, no I'm talking way before, like in the early '30s, um, when he went up against Ono. Ono, yeah. He, the guy was training a triangle, etc. So the guy knew submissions, so he yeah. wasn't, you know, he, he. But at the same time, he knew how to throw, mm -hmm. and still Elio survived against him. I find that match one of, like, it's the most underrated match in my opinion. Like I say, like he threw him around 34 times. Yeah, if you can send, uh, if you can send that, any, if is there any footage of that? No, no. Ah, okay. there's no, no. See that? That's the early 30s. That makes me interested because a guy like Helio, who comes from the lineage of Maeda, right? But then Maeda is totally separated from the Kozen Judo schools in Kyoto. So in Kyoto... No, no, there's the, the Maeda lineage, yes, it came, they learned, but then they moved around, I believe in the 1920s, they learned more under uh, Donato Pires. Yeah. And then uh, I believe... Uh, um, that you had Jo Omori, Jo Omori, in my opinion, that what really gave them their like the bulk, I would say, 
um, when mm. it comes to not only just stand up, but also ground. Uh, Omori came later after that. And, uh, you know, Drysdale said it once, I, I forgot where, but he said that if there's anyone that should be really credited for giving the like, Elio and Carlos like a lot of good stuff, it should be J.O. Omori. Mm. So yeah. it's not so much so I'm uh, like Maeda because Maeda was like an indirect teacher. Yeah. Uh, Jacinto Ferro taught him, but Jacinto was trained under Maeda. And then mm. they left. They moved because uh, they left Belém do Pará for financial uh, reasons. They settled in uh, Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And then they learned under uh, Donato Pires, which was a hand-to-hand combat instructor who, who was trained under Jacinto Ferro. So it's the um, like a like the not the first like the you have two guys after Maeda t- training them and not Maeda directly so a lot of things were more uh, towards the stand up you know he was in the police um, uh, Donato Pires so it was more about self defense and really stand up that's why I would say the idea of self defense and really giving it a lot of time and drills came from the teachings of Donato Pires but in terms of judo and competitive. It came, I would say, from a lot from Gio Mori. Do you think there's a, the reason why there is because of the secretiveness of like these techniques? That's why there's a lot of how clear is the evolution of it, right? Mm. That we have to go on these really deep journeys of discovery yeah. to figure out where yeah. stuff came from. Like, you know, we even talk about, you talk about, you know, knee bars and, and leg locks being done, you know, you know, before the turn of the century. And now it's like everyone rediscovered them now, right? Mm. You know, in the last decade so it's almost like because it was so secretive it seems like we have to keep going on this journey of rediscovery yeah uh (laughs) it's secret but at the same time um nothing it's i don't i don't know how to say this but uh it's not it's not like politics is to be like everything (laughs) in politics like military uh meetings between this prime minister or whatever, like everything is documented. So history is just there. But when it comes to martial art, it's really, yes, it's a product of its own society, mm-hmm. but um, the documentation is really, you know, through like newspapers, like our old scrolls or old memoirs, you know, written by, you know, Yam- Yamashita or whoever, like the four guardians, uh, so it's up to us to really compile them and really go through them and to really see what happened. Like now I'm sure you know that history of, you know, just people learning judo in Brazil is far more complicated than, you know, we are when we first heard about it. <laughs> Obvious, yeah. I mean, that's, that to me is like the, the two big pieces in my mind of trying to discover this as far as the history goes. Well, number one, let's take history out, history out of it for a second. The whole method of clinch takedown Position submission, which is such a huge, you know, um, point to Brazilian jiu-jitsu and a huge uh, method. I, I'm so curious to see if that was developed over time with Maeda and to the Gracies or vice versa. Or was it a combination, you know, of the Maeda with, uh, you know, developing it in street fights. That, that specific method of fighting, if you will, you know, that yeah. whole idea and where that came from. That's what I'm kind of more focused on right now because it's that that's what for me really changed the martial arts history and it would change the whole world when Royce Gracie did that in the UFC and everybody knows that that's what they preach it's all clinch from the standing take your partner down that where that started to come from I'm trying to learn was that more of Maeda showing the Gracies and they you know refined it or was it the Gracies that really took it that's like a real big uh, you know question no uh if there's if there's something you really have to give it to the Gracies. I would say it's uh, it's really ground and pound uh, dissection. They really know how to defend against it. Uh, like the uh, Gracie combatives, Elio was very big on defending against ground and pound from the guard. Or if someone is mounting you, when I, when I had my talk with Pedro, he mentioned this. Uh, mm-hmm. But like that that sequence of you know clinch, take him down, you know uh, immobilize him. And then finish with whatever. It's old. Um, let me give you a uh, a uh, an incident that happened around 1912. So Elio was born in 1913. So that a year, like 
Elio was a fetus back then. So it was, uh, I believe, in uh, in Europe. It was in Europe back when uh, jujitsu masters like Yuki Otani and uh, Sadakazu Uyanishi. They are uh, later on. They uh, they met with Kodokan and they met Jigoro Kano. But uh, before that, they came from the Yataro Honda Jujitsu School. So they had a lot of uh, Kodokan techniques in their uh, in their curriculum. I'd say it was very much inspired. They like the the origins of that school. It's not that much clear, but uh, like looking from their books, like the game of Jujitsu, um, you know Sadakazu Uyanishi's book as well, 1905. You would see a lot of Kodokan techniques. So I would say it had a lot of uh, Kodokan history in it. But mm. the in terms of that school, where it comes from, again, I, I can't find far, a lot of evidence on it. Uh, if mm. I do later on, then I'll share it, obviously. But they were jujitsu, basically, uh, teachers. They went to Europe. They made money through professional wrestling. They taught jujitsu, self-defense. Um, one of his students uh, in 1912, um, he went up against a Savat master, you know, French boxing, mm -hmm. and he did the same thing. Clinch took him down, armbarred him, and won the fight. So this idea of, you know, doing that, taking the fight to the ground via a very powerful throw and then engaging in a very good top game is not so much Gracie-oriented or Gracie-pioneered uh, in a sense, but... That makes sense. Uh, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, there is evidence that it's been done before, but obviously back then the media wasn't as powerful like today with the whole federations mm -hmm. and TV and cameras. But uh, there is the photo of him arm barring him in 1912. I'll send it to you later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the graces, what they really worked on and it's really powerful, I'd say it's a ground and pound uh, mm -hmm. study. Ground and pound defense, like when somebody's on top of you and you have the guard defending when yes. you're and keep mm -hmm. it tight. Yeah, I like agree. I've looked... Yes, I looked through many books of old Japanese jiu-jitsu or Kodokan. Barely nothing about ground and pound. Yes, they tell you that when you're, when you're thrown, you get your legs close like this. Mm. That's Yukiotani saying it. You don't turtle, all that stuff that would protect you. But in terms of really hammering the ground and pound, mm -hmm. uh, I would say it's, uh, it's Elio. And, you know, the whole Valdemar Santana where he got ground and pounded, yeah, uh, you would see his the photo. His face was like this. He got soccer kick. So really, through trial and error, and that uh, experience, I would say, really affected him into studying more and really crafting ground and pound study. Yeah, and the second part of that that that's the one topic that you can go so deep in. The second topic is what we kind of discussed already. Like you know, we heard Pedro Valente say the triangle wasn't even done in the Gracie curriculum or down in Brazil with the Gracies specifically until the seventies. So my question is, is like. You know, in Kozen Judo in Kyoto, Japan, and when they were doing all of that in the early 1900s and didn't get down to Brazil till then, how much of what we've seen in Brazil was straight through Maeda and that lineage? Remember, Ma Maeda left Japan and didn't get to see and be a part of the Kozen Judo developments. And how much of Gracie's and Helio's training came from Kozen via people that went to Japan? Uh, or came from Japan to Brazil. You know what I mean? Is it a mixture of Kozen Judo and Maeda that went to the Gracies, or specifically just Maeda stuff and teachings? No, it's it's a mix of both. Like I would say, the the emphasis on self defense. Mm. You know, um, you can see from Maeda's book on self defense, um, the whole Donato Pires thing, you know, yeah. hand to hand instructor. He was in the police, so. That's obviously what interested him, and that's obviously what I would say he taught the most to them. And also, you had the the Kyoto influence, like the Kyoto judoka's influence, mm -hmm. and it's a great strategy taking someone to the ground. If you if you have superior tactics on the ground, like the whole 1918 thing, really speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, and Pedro said to me that you know, in a controlled environment. Uh, against someone where you have spear newaza taking them to the ground and finishing finishing them off it's the best thing you can do mm. so uh i would say it's a mix of both when it comes to valet tudo and really competing and going through challenges it's the the whole thing with um you know what happened with luta livre and uh, yeah. that's not something that i know a lot about but in terms of the ground aspect uh, in terms of competition I would say uh, mostly Kyoto Jidokas, Takeo Yano, Gio Mori, all those people um, really influenced 
to how things you know should go on the ground and really controlling them with superior tactics to guard, um, you know, top game, uh, isolating, etc. Like you see, the Gracies, yes, they they fought uh, like Luta Livre and so on, but you know, it's it's a different philosophy when you, once you see it being demonstrated. Now it's different because you know it's a melting pot between Luta Livre and BGJ, but before that it was more of the catch wrestling expression of, uh, you know, it's not so much position than submission, mm. but you see that a lot in Gracie basics, like Hickson, yeah. for example. So you'd see it's more of judo influence, and then they took it to Valley Tudo. Mm. Um, so I would say it's the bulk of Kyoto when it comes to competition and self-defense. It's more of the Maya, Maya lineage. If, yeah. If I would, like from my yeah. own observation. Yeah, to Brian's point, you know, it seems like we're all re revisiting right now all of these things that, you know, coming from Kozen Judo in Kyoto, Japan, from the early 1900s, leg entries and ashigaramis is all being revisited now, you know, kind of could be a lot of a big surprise to a lot of people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. So what else do we have on the list here? We have a couple of things, uh, different topics for you. So, yeah, I wanted to go into one more topic with you here. And then we can bring up these uh, YouTube clips. The last topic was the, the specific uh, judo rules that have developed over years and years and years as an, as an Olympic sport. You know, a lot of people argue it's, it's less and less realistic self-defense-wise, and, and I, I agree with them. Um, but specifically as it compares to Brazilian jiu-jitsu rules, I'd like to point out uh, that it seems to me that Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, is at a point where now a lot of different rule sets are coming out and people are confused at what the rules should be to make it more exciting and not guys just stalling out. Um, you see, a lot of the original rules created in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu highly award points for positions. So over time, yeah. you know, people are just really good at holding positions. Obviously, the goal is submission. Now, in my mind, Judo, the ultimate goal is the Ippon, right? You get an Ippon, boom, full point, uh, you win the match. In Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you, you award for the submission. The goal is the submission. In Judo, the goal is the Ippon. And in Judo, you're not getting any points for position like you do in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And in Judo, if you get kind of an almost Ippon, you know, it's like, well, sorry, I don't know exactly how it goes, but it, it's quarter points and it adds up to a full point. I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu should look to Judo as a, an example of the rule sets in the sense we should only be awarding for submissions and almost submissions and not really positions. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I think, you know, from watching and reading, you know, PDFs of IBJJF and IJF, mm -hmm. I think both, um, both disciplines, like, because now they diverged a lot. Um, I would say they, suffered, uh, you know, the, the realism took a, a big hit mm -hmm. through sports rules. Mm -hmm. I think we can agree on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, when, first, let me talk about judo. Um, the, the whole thing with leg grabs, um, I had a talk with uh, Neil Adams, who is one of the members of the IGF and one of the rule makers. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole thing is very political. Uh, it was 2010, the IOC or the International Olympic Committee came to them, said to them, you know, hey, uh, these judokas uh, are, are starting to, to go down and down, down like this. And a lot of the Ippons or Wazaris are being scored in a very sloppy, you know, gripping the pants on, like, and then just driving forward. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to look like wrestling. You know, be careful, your popularity, the numbers are you know, not looking good compared to wrestling. And so they came, at first, this is what they did. At first, they said, gripping the leg directly is Hansukomake or immediate elimination. Mm -hmm. But what you can do, that this is from 2010 to 2012. What you can do is you start a upper body attack and then finish with a leg grab. Like, for example, you see it a lot in BJJ. You, you do an inner uh, trip or reap. And then you finish by gripping the leg and taking them down. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a drop shoulder throw. Then, okay, if it doesn't work, I grip the leg and it turns into a fireman's carry or mm -hmm. kataguruma. Uh, at first, it was that. Or, for example, uh, I can use it. I can grip the leg as 
um, a counter technique. For example, someone's going for Haragoshi or Uchimata, I can grab the leg and keep spinning them into like a Teguruma or Skuinage. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of people, as Adam said it, it's, they started to exploit the gray areas of this rule. Like, oh, am I technically now attempting a throw? Then I would go grab the leg. You know, they started to play on that. So they made it as black and white as possible. And then they just said everything below the belt is Hansu Kumake. Now it's Shido. It's like a, um, three Shidos or three penalties is, you know, you get eliminated. But before mm -hmm. that, it's like if you grip, it, it's you're gone, basically. And yeah. I don't agree with that whatsoever. So, uh, but now it's better. Like, okay, if you gripped or you're trying to like push the leg, um, it's one penalty, which is fine. Uh, and then, you know, judo's popularity soared again. And now it's actually Greco or wrestling that's really suffering in terms of popularity. So you can mm -hmm. clearly see it wasn't about safety. It wasn't about, you know, martial capabilities. Uh, it was just basically to stay alive in the Olympics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, now, there is some things that, you know, I see the good in it. For example, the, the upright posture. Upright posture is very important. Self-defense-wise, you can even read it in uh, Kano's uh, writings when he talks about, you know, when you're bending forward, it's a lot harder to, uh, to move. Yeah. And also, you're very vulnerable to strikes to the head and the chest and your back of your head. Uh, but keeping upright, you can move slowly. You can see the bigger picture. Um, and also, they wanted to, like I'm talking about the IJF, they wanted to focus more on like big picturesque throws or swift uh, foot sweeps. So, for example, a double leg, it's a lot easier than doing an uchimata. I've been trying to do uchimata for three years now, and um, it's not easy compared to like a double leg or ankle pick or knee pick. Um, right. They still believe that you can still defend when someone, like another grappler is trying to grip you. I've defended, for example, against BJJ guys on open mats. When they try to grip my leg, you can sprawl. The way we sprawl against drop attacks, like the drop fireman's carry without the leg or the drop shoulder throw, we, we're basically sprawling when we go down with them. It's hip defense. And also, good grip fighting can really help you uh, defend against uh, someone diving for your legs. I get it. It's an argument. But uh, again, when it comes to martial utility or self-defense, you are taking away, like, again, there are not many. There are like four or five techniques with the legs mm -hmm. compared to 67 throws. Yeah. But in terms of heritage, in terms of, uh, you know, what the future generations will learn, etc., I, I think, yes, we are losing, and especially someone that's really concerned with history. Um, in my opinion, they should allow it. Like, if you can find a context where you can stay upright, you can stay fighting for the grips like in judo, you can still maintain a judo expression and still go for the legs, not just immediately just dive in. I would 100% support it. But mm -hmm. uh, in terms of self-defense, you know, gripping the upper body and controlling it, that's still very good. That's still very vital, in my opinion. That still carries over to street self-defense um, because Kano always uh, uh, argued for a an upright posture that can move easily compared to old jiu-jitsu when it's, it's called jigotai. It's like a bent knees, really mm -hmm. wide stance, hips. So you're, first you're slow and also you're very prone to attacks because you're, because you're slow, you can't evade. And okay. also, you know, there's the knees I can grip you all that stuff. Um, but in terms of uh, going for the legs, I do believe that it should come from upper body grips and then going for the legs. You can easily do that. Um, so in terms of martial utility, technical heritage, yes, it did push it backwards. But in terms of expression, it's beautiful. Now judo is more picturesque. It's more beautiful. But yeah. again, on the streets, you're not going to be doing that because you know a picturesque throw, it's going to mm -hmm. land you in jail. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, Competition-wise, they did the right thing in keeping it alive, etc. But uh, I still believe it should be taught. Like you can always go for, you know, two rounds out of every sparring session. You know, go for the legs, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, like what I'm trying to say is, I see the good in, you know, uh, having an upright posture and really focusing on the upper body and, you know, swift leg sweeps. Uh, but at the same time. Um, I want to find a solution for leg grabs that keeps judo's uh, expression and stance judo. Mm. 
But yeah, BJJ, it, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's just, you see that split between sport and self-defense. Even in BJJ now, there's a lot of camps that just want to focus on self-defense. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that are looking to forward and grow the sport itself. Right. And there's a lot of people that want to do one or the other. They can't see doing both. Now, I, I agree, you know, yeah. that I, most of the people that walk through my doors here, you know, they don't come in purely because they're looking to defend themselves. A lot of people mm -hmm. are looking for a different workout now. You know, and a lot of people see the UFC and things like that. There's, there's a combination. There's people that want self-defense. And you know what? There's people that just are looking for a different workout. I think back in the day, you know, a lot of people just purely were looking for martial arts that to learn self-defense and I want to learn how to defend myself. And that, that's a that's a secondary thing from training BJJ. You get to learn how to, you know, defend yourself against most people out there that don't train. I truly believe that. You know, we see the rules now with judo. I believe jujitsu and grappling can learn a lot because they're really getting rid of the stalling and they're really forwarding the sport, you know, and they're really only awarding what the major goal is in judo, which is the ippon. And look at wrestling. They're only really rewarding what the major goal is in wrestling is the pin. You know, you're going to get two points yeah. for a takedown because you're bringing it down there. You know what I mean? But you're not yeah. getting awarded per specific position. So I feel like you know, we can learn a lot from judo and wrestling and jiu-jitsu and seeing where the different rule sets are and seeing what's successful and what's not, you know. Um, but, yeah, so that was that was pretty much the, the last topic I wanted to talk about. And I think, uh, you know, now we can uh, bring yep. a couple of videos for you at the, t the time in the podcast here. I have two different videos for you. One um, is, uh, like I said, uh, Jason Morris. It's an um, old-school judo uh, practitioner that I like to follow. He, he's heavily coaching uh, in MMA, and a lot of jiu-jitsu guys have been um, learning his judo techniques for MMA. I think they're great. I came across this video years ago of him uh, utilizing his judo yeah. in, a, in a college wrestling setting, and I think it's amazing. Uh, a lot of people can look it up on YouTube, look up uh, Jason Morris judo highlight. And uh, so I wanted you to take a look at this, and as the video goes through and we bring it up, just kind of get your – uh, commentary and thoughts. We'll play it through. There's some music in the background so we can mute that. And then, uh, yeah, let's see uh, what you think. Great counter to Ranage. His hit technique is really good, and like Harai Goshi, like here, this is Tayotoshi. Whoa. This is Soto Matikomi. Also, for that, he Okay, I really like um, when someone gets a hold of his hips or his legs. He used that to his advantage. So because like they're very pinned to his uh, to his hips and they're behind him, he would just utilize uh, judo's old uh, hip techniques like harai goshi or mm -hmm. um, he did uh, before that uki goshi. So uh, I think like there's there can be a lot to do that because uh, I, you would see a lot in the no gi when they're trying to you know where wrestle each other. They try to take someone's back even before they go to the ground. Uh, I think a lot of like Jason Jason Morris tactics can be very useful in uh, no gi. I would say here is Kosuto Gari. Uh, the the use of his legs is brilliant. Um, that's what wrestling is uh, needs in my opinion. Uh, a lot of the the uh, A lot of the uh, new like instructionals on fanatics. A lot of these wrestlers are trying to incorporate like oh Chigari. Uh, the stuff you see Justin Flores doing as well, like he's putting a lot of judo in the, into wrestling. Uh, I think uh, this is the, in my opinion, the missing piece for wrestling. Maybe sacrifice throws would be next, but there's not, not that much gi grip, like solid grip. It's all over and unders. So the missing piece of wrestling in order to make it more, uh, uh, like I'd say palatable to watch, like aesthetically pleasing to watch is you know, the use of your legs in, in terms of attacks. Mm. Um, I think that's a very surprising element that he had against other wrestlers, the use of his legs. Uh, because Ashiwaza in judo is, in my opinion, like 
the best you can possibly do. Yeah, that's why I love this video. Again, so against, like here you see, so he has a great clinch. He has hips to hips contact, but he put his leg on the outside and reaped it, and he got the advantage of it. The use of makikomi or the wrap around and sacrificing himself on the ground, that's a great tactic as well. It can be done in nogi, so uh, no wonder he, he used it in, instead of something like uh, circular throw or tomoe nage. And, and what's crazy is most of his throws, if you notice, almost all his opponents are landing on their back. Barely any of them are going belly down, like what you want to see in wrestling. He's going mm -hmm. better, belly down, which is crazy if you look at some of his throws. He, he's, he's demonstrating Ippon Judo in wrestling. Yeah. Like here you see his uh, Sotomaki or Osotomaki Komi. Mm. Like you do an Osotogari, but then you wrap around and then you sacrifice yourself to the ground. So it's a Osotogari entrance. Then you sacrifice yourself by wrapping him around you, and then they fall on their back. So mm -hmm. that's great if someone's trying to get your back. I believe this is most college level wrestling, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even some high school too. And it was, you know, noted that back in the 90s or late 80s, which is I think when this was mostly taken, a lot of college wrestling and high school wrestling was done more standing up, yeah. more upright positions, which you see a lot more uh, ability to uh, engage in the uh, judo techniques of senior demon. And which translates more to MMA and self-defense because people are going to be standing more upright, you know, mm -hmm. when they're striking. Yeah. So th that's why, for example, I see like the silver lining in, uh, in, you know, no leg grabs because you don't really concern yourself of going down and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, exposing yourself, but rather really standing upright and controlling the upper body, you know, um, they cannot have that, you know, huge range for, for yeah. a big strike against basically and, uh, uh, and Justin Flores too. We're going to be having him on the podcast as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think he can uh, shed a lot of insight. He has the grappling Trinity in my opinion, like the wrestling judo BJJ. Definitely. So yeah, I think there's a yeah. lot to be said about the, um, you know, the, the realisticness. Like we were just talking about the, the, you know, when people go belly down, as right. Brian said, to defend a throw. I mean, mm -hmm. like, like you had mentioned before, Chadi, you're going to be going to the hospital when you land belly down to defend a throw if that's in a real situation. You know, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, having that said, was yesterday. Yeah, that's that's a bad. That's kind of a negative, right? To the to the uh, the sportive side, in a sense, when you're mm -hmm. just looking to avoid the yeah of course, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's crazy. Yeah, how like uh, Pedro Pedro said, like one of the big points of us when we spar in our school, because they're very much oriented towards self-defense is no turtling and uh, far more clinching because the range of the grip fighting of judo, yes, you can control, etc. cetera, but uh, there is, like, you leave some space and that space can be used against you in terms of if someone like really lands a lucky strike against you. Mm, it looks like you yeah so so i got i got one question for you what is the yeah. thing what is the the completely false thing do you think something that most martial artists believe or even judo or jiu-jitsu believe in the history of it that's just completely false like the most common thing uh, it's a tough one <laughs> Is this, um, well, yeah. now after like endless talks, I believe like there's not that much, but now I'm discovering something new. Uh, like you have, you know, the whole thing that, you know, the, the 1993 and then we, we, we figured out that a lot of these traditional martial arts are just hocus pocus and they don't work. And now we know what works for real, you know, uh, and that's basically jujitsu and judo and wrestling. Like these are the noble arts, but uh, there is something about these traditional martial arts that, um, again, you need history in order to understand why they are in this shape that they are in today. Uh, mm -hmm. Chinese martial arts aside, because not I, I did not dive into that world yet, but yeah. in terms of, for example, Japanese martial arts, like. Uh, Judo, I said, I said it, uh, it's Tenjin Shinoryu and Kitoryu. Now, if you go on YouTube right now and type Tenjin Shinoryu, you'd see a demonstration and you would 100%, 100% call it Bushido. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like without a shadow of a doubt. And that's one of the parents of Judo. And mm -hmm. the reason is um, a lot of them, you know, they were very close to being eradicated 
you know, with the, the cultural shift of Japan and also um, you had the Americans after World War II, they had to stop a lot of martial arts from training. So many of these martial arts, they evolved more towards a ceremonial practice. I'll give you an example, uh, Kyudo. Do you know Kyudo? Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, the way of the uh, bow. Yep, yep. So before that, it was it was Kyujutsu. It was like you're hitting targets, you're running around the field. Uh, you do it on your knees, you shoot on your knees, you see targets, you shoot, you, you shoot one after one after one after one. Now it's more like you go in. Uh, it's an eight-phase uh, kata or drill, like a kata, mm -hmm. and you you do this, and then you elongate, like you stretch, and then you shoot, and then you stay calm. You know, showing mental uh, control. You step out, if it, whether you hit the target or not. They're trying to teach you that it's all in the process of the preparation, mm -hmm. uh, because if you prepare well. The, the arrow itself will, will find its way to the target. It's not you that has to shoot it. It's, you know, it's, it's trying to teach you something. So a right. lot of these arts became more about that. Like, you know, you they say like, you know, your, your grandma is training Tai Chi at the park. Uh, it mm -hmm. doesn't work. Uh, but if you see like the, the whole thing in Tai Chi, like in China, how they wrestled uh, mm -hmm. or many of these old Jiu Jitsu that you hear about like in the accounts, they would spar non-stop. So, and also there was this uh, tradition called dojo yaburi, which is uh, uh, like, for example, I go to your school, uh, I train with you, and I respectfully, you know, spar with your students. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of the times, like they would say, like they had like really great techniques, they had really great setups, etc. So maybe I would go and train with that school as well, or you know, leave my school completely if I get destroyed. So. Uh, so sparring and surprise guests was a common thing. So many of these arts, you know, developed, became only kata for either cultural preservation or, uh, you know, became ceremonial religious practices. And, you know, they're not what they're, you know, um, uh, like they're a shadow of what they used to be. But, you know, if you, if you take something like, like what Kano took in, uh, jujitsu, it, it, it's, was far more drilling of self-defense, like, you know, Valente Brothers do, and a lot of randori. So, uh, but it transitioned more into the sportive aspect, obviously, with the evolution of time, a lot of... But to say... Some countries went through in terms of war is, in my opinion, uh, unfair, let's just say, to these arts. Uh, like I showed uh, a, a video like of you know old jujitsu techniques. Uh, I actually got. I'm getting. I ordered a book of that Tenjin Shinryu. I want to see the, the entire syllabus on the ground and stand up. And I want to see if there's like more submissions, something that would never be done today, mm -hmm. uh, or more throws or neck cranks or whatever it may be. Uh, so I would like, for example, the methodology of training. It's changed. Like so, if you're not sparring anymore, you're still doing these techniques. Obviously, you're not going to be efficient in them. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing is, uh, are you doing it for religious practices like, you know, Kyudo or or are you sparring like you do in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu or Kudokan uh, or, or whatever school it may be? So mm -hmm. saying traditional martial arts are just now, you know, all bogus and there's only a few select that are good mm -hmm. uh, and not everyone spars or they have, you know, bad techniques or it's all mysticism. I think it's unfair. Not many claim mysticism whatsoever, especially in uh, Japan. Later on, yes, some people try to claim, you know, bogus stuff. But mm -hmm. before, like in the days of the challenges, in the days of the schools trying to survive, there was a lot of sparring and challenges between schools. Like if I know anyone from any school is going to come to my dojo at any time, I better be ready. So... Mm -hmm. Again, it's the, the methodology of training, how it evolved, whether that school still exists or not. Um, what's the purpose of training today compared to 200 years ago? So uh, in my opinion, the new false thing to say, in my opinion now, it's traditional martial arts don't work. Hmm. Yeah. Because I'm judo sure. is the traditional. Like you have BJJ, which is a, a subset of a subset. Like you had the old uh, jujitsu techniques of, you know, the, the stuff that Kano put in judo and also um, that were 
considered dangerous, like flying wrist locks. And, uh, you know, you go down with his wrist and, you know, you, you put him on your back, like, a uh, like him facing up and then you just flip him like an F five basically, but his uh, torso is up. You, you do not roll him into safety, like a good Yukemi, right. all that stuff, I would say. Uh, and then he removed that stuff. And then you have people who remove the stand up. You are only doing the ground. So saying the ground only works, but the, the ancestor doesn't work. It, it's, it's ridiculous. Mm, I agree. Well, Charlie, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming thank on. You. Uh, what's that, eight, uh, about eight, I don't know, nine, 9 p.m. there? Was it like 9 p.m.? Yeah, 9, 10. 9, 10, okay. Yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, have, let's uh, yeah. tell everybody where we can find you on YouTube, Instagram, and uh, all of that. Uh, my YouTube channel is called Shady. Just type Shady Judo, C-H-A-D-I judo you will find me it's very easy i have hundreds of videos and on instagram it's shady.ae 